one factor that healthcare professionals are best positioned to control. And over the last four years, I've been thinking very hard in terms of like what quality of life means from a standpoint of what healthcare professionals really can contribute to that patient care experience. And from my own, you know, experiences, encounters in the healthcare space, I think, you know, for me personally, it's boiled down to, you know, three separate concepts, communication, innovation, and technological integration. And those, I think, in my own experiences, are the driving factors of a successful accountable care organization that's really oriented towards patient-centered care, you know, looking ahead to the needs of the 20 percent. So first and foremost, you know, I wanted to just take a small qualitative look at the first two and then see if we can possibly bring in the technological piece in the second part. So first, you know, the question being how we deliver communication, how we deliver innovation in the healthcare space. In my experience, uh, not all patients are necessarily created equal. If you take an emergency department, for example, you know, no one misses a beat when a patient shows up with cardiac failure. They know what the needs are. They respond. And, you know, in the short term, and usually in the long term, there's an established protocol that patients can be engaged, and usually they recover. However, not all patients are necessarily as well supported as that. And in my own experiences, actually, in the healthcare space, I've seen, for instance, very often some populations which are a little bit more marginalized not receive the same level of care services. So for instance, I would just offer as a, as a proposition that if someone is coming into the healthcare space, say an emergency department, and they're 18 years old or 20 years old and drunk, possibly having fallen and hurt themselves, being loud and verbally abusive, being restrained, being argumentative, that it can be very difficult for someone to look at them the same way receiving the same level of services. And that challenge, I think, reflects not just on the short term, but in the long term, because we have to consider you know, what the long term implications are of patients who transition from that at-risk behavior and become lifelong users of that emergency department. The challenge being you know, that some services that we do have are structurally deficient in terms of how we deliver our services. So, for instance, I can tell you uh, that there are 40 plus years of clinically backed research that tells us that um, brief motivational interviews are very helpful in terms of turning those patients away from this destructive behavior. <coughs> that even a 15 minute conversation with someone from the standpoint of what brought you into the ER? What do you recall from last night? What would you rather have done differently? Impacting that experience and moving someone to be much less likely to readmit through that same condition. And I can actually point to studies that support a five-year protective effect with a 15-minute conversation. And the obvious question being, well, why hasn't the service been structured to provide to all of these patients who we can clearly identify as needing the service? And honestly, you know, the first is that even if such an effort may save billions of dollars, in the payer side, it's worth precisely zero. It's not a reimbursed service. And even if it were, we have a separate challenge where you're talking about that most precious commodity in the healthcare space of time. And whose time is going to be represented with that 15 minutes? Is it going to be the attending physicians? Is it going to be the residents? Is it going to be the nurses? And so the question being, even if you have a clinically appropriate response, how does it work in the space? And so for St. Elizabeth's, we actually decided that we had to go outside the normal bounds of thinking, recruit peer experts from the local universities, including Boston College, and bringing them into the clinical environment to support an appropriate level of dialogue. Because the clinical experts did not have the time, it was much easier to recruit certified EMTs, train them to that level of clinical proficiency, and then have them staff shift coverage on the weekends so that they would be available to support those types of discussions. And as the physicians would identify the need, they would facilitate the referral. And then the clinical staff could receive back all of the data that these students would gather regarding the patient's condition and needs. Now, well, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because we are very often seeing subpopulations that are being masked in the data we have. So the initial impression of many people in the emergency department was that all patients were presenting for much the same backgrounds and much the same reasons. But that's not the case. So we did find, for instance, many people who, as you might expect, were socially blowing off steam, right, subsequent to peer pressure. But we also found people suffering from depression, 
financial difficulties, family struggles, academic challenges, and in some cases, the survivors of rape and abuse. So the fact of the matter is, which patient population was coming back to the ERs more frequently? And what other ancillary services were they not receiving in a triage, treat, and discharge model? So the only point I wanted to make in this first piece is that there are qualitative aspects of how care is delivered today that are really not supportable with our current staffing infrastructure. And that as we look outwards, you know, in the coming months and years, we may find different methods of care delivery that are cost contained and appropriate, but it involves rethinking about the current silos we have for the distribution of healthcare information. Because there are the future generation of healthcare professionals who may be prepared to support quality healthcare today, but are not yet being given the opportunity to do so. So if we move beyond that very specific context, I mean, most of my professional work at Stewart has been in interpretive services. You know, it becomes increasingly more complex. If we have these segments among a very well understood patient population of mostly high school and college students, how much more complex does the conversation become when we include so many different cultural and linguistic backgrounds in interpretive services? And honestly, it was a very new experience for me coming into the interpretive services world. I was the only person in my department, born in the United States, speaking English as my first language and to feel like an outsider looking in, but to be welcomed as someone who could be an advocate for the department in terms of what their specific needs are. I can't possibly say enough in praise of the professional competencies of medical interpreters. If you think about it, a medical interpreter has to be trained and tested proficient for every single discipline of medical knowledge, whether it be dermatology, cardiology, oncology, maternity, even the last rites. And they have to know every single one of those terms in all of the languages they are trained and verified in. In some cases, that was five or six languages. And not only that, but to be ethically bound to add or subtract nothing from the conversations that they facilitated on behalf of both the patient and the providers that they supported. And here's where we get to the challenge of the problem. Because let's take the hypothetical alternative of a medical interpreter not being readily available. And the case of a physician telling a 13-year-old daughter, please let your father know that he has an incurable brain tumor and is going to die. That conversation happens, and I'm not talking about it in a hypothetical context. I'm not sure how many of you may be familiar with Dr. Joseph Betancourt of Partners Healthcare, but he actually was discussing this in open forum at the 2011 International Medical Interpreters Association, where he actually put slides on the uh, screen where he said, you know, more than 30% of the residents in my hospital system that I serve admitted to using children under the age of 12 to discuss urgent medical information with the patient. And this is one of the world's leading healthcare providers. And I don't use it to castigate one specific hospital system but to showcase a practice which undercuts efforts at quality, which place all of us at risk, no matter what hospital system or provider may be involved, or even outside the bounds of hospital-centered care. How does this impact where the healthcare space is going? More significantly than many people realize, there was a rheumatologist in New Jersey several years ago successfully sued a provider for discrimination on the basis of refusing to provide an American Sign Language interpreter. That final cost to the provider was $635,000, which was not covered by medical malpractice. I will say this again, was not covered by medical malpractice because it was a discrimination case that fell outside the bounds of clinically inappropriate care. The provider did nothing clinically wrong except to refuse to honor a reasonable request which they were obligated to offer in exchange for accepting Medicare, Medicaid, and other government funding. So in this situation where we can talk about a pervasive issue, <coughs> part of my work with interpreter services was to make the department as efficient as possible. One of my first web-based dispatching initiatives was reducing the response time for interpreters from 25 to 12 minutes, which dramatically improved our response times and productivity. And then working with IT and telecommunications, 
to develop a web of telephonic and video supported options so that we had a range of supportive resources from staff interpreters and agency interpreters all the way down to the specific technology supported solutions where we could run an incredibly efficient service line supporting the needs of a growing accountable care organization with the idea that we already have that qualitative model in place and now we have the economies of scale to support it and the technological fallbacks that at every single point of service across the steward system whether a patient was scheduled or unscheduled, whether the language need was known in advance or not, the patient could receive culturally competent care as they presented with no advance notification required. Preferred, certainly, but not needed. So in this situation, you know, as we move toward the qualitative, we have to ask ourselves what best practices we, we need. As we identify those best practices, we need to look to technology to support the economies of scale to make such care sustainable. And uh, that's my presentation for this evening, and I'll turn the second section over to my friend David. Thank you so much for the enlightening talk, um, Aaron. Well, our next speaker doesn't need any introduction. <laughs> 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 but, I highly suggest uh, you to go to his award-winning healthcare blog, which is called as Health Blog, which is uh, spelled as B L A W G. So please, please join uh, David. He has a big Twitter following. Um, I have a personal connection with uh, David. Uh, for the first time I met him, it was a um, what conference was that, David? Uh, one of the health camps. Yes, health camps health camps and it was in unconference style and I was so impressed by it and that was my motivation to start Health Innovators. So I have a uh, personal connection with David and he's been a good friend uh, since uh, since then and so I want to, um, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, David Hollow. Thank you very much. So, um, 20 years ago I worked for the Department of Public Health and uh, one of the things that I worked on was uh, interpreter services conditions that were imposed on hospitals. If they wanted to spend money, basically started a, uh, a linkage program, with people, which people might be familiar with from the, from the um, real estate <coughs> development context in the city of Boston. If you build a new um, office building downtown, they basically squeeze a few bucks out of you to, uh, to, to invest in the neighborhoods. And we did the same thing at the Department of Public Health, people building a new hospital, we squeezed a few bucks out of them to uh, invest in community health services or community focused services. And one of those was interpreter services and uh, promoting interpreter um, service availability. And uh, what, what you said tonight is very interesting because it's not, just a, it's not enough just to say, this is, how you, this is what you need to do, and this is how you're going to fund it. Um, there's the whole uh, trust but verify approach here. Uh, if, if, if partners is not able to accomplish uh, something in accordance with those goals, I'm sure that many other providers are not able to as well. And it's something that needs to be um, routinized in the way that you've, you've described. Um, what I wanted to talk about tonight is to sort of give a, a, an, an introduction to some of the uh, healthcare information privacy issues and the way it's regulated uh, today. Uh, part of the, the, the follow-on to the question of interpreter services is how is that information stored? How is it used? How is it communicated? If you're using an off-site interpreter through some telephonic service or web-based service, um, is there a requirement for uh, security around that information? And well beyond the interpreter world, uh, there's also the question of how do you ensure appropriate levels of privacy and security for all sorts of healthcare information that could be flowing from healthcare provider to healthcare provider, from patient to provider, provider to patient, provider to caregiver, uh, etc. The, the permutations are are endless. And I think what we sometimes lose track of 
when we're focused on the technicalities of the rules or the or the or the um, uh, technology, is that all of these rules and protections are created to protect the rights of patients. Right? So, uh, if a patient asks a healthcare provider for a copy of his or her record, often an initial misguided response is, I'm sorry, I can't, HIPAA, uh, right? And that sort of turns the whole thing on its head. Uh, but, but this is what happens. Uh, as, as new rules are promulgated in the healthcare space, each new rule for a certain number of years is probably uh, a, a number of years that we could identify, we could call it the, uh, the Harlow number. Um, for three years, let's say, every time you ask someone in healthcare to do something that's reasonable, they say, no, I can't, <laughs> or, or it used to be, no, well, that would be a stark violation, or you know, fraud and abuse, can't help you. Um, but it's usually born of a misunderstanding of the rules and a lack of focus on the real reason we're involved in healthcare, which is helping patients. Um, so, I'd like to delve for a moment into some of the patient protective pieces of the new HIPAA rule, which was enacted in January uh, and became effective in September and affects one way or another most of the people in this room because we're all involved in healthcare technology and healthcare data. And so to the extent we're touching information that is quote unquote in, in HIPAA language, uh, protected health information, this applies to all of us. And as I mentioned to someone uh, before we got together, before we sat down, um, there are also many situations in which healthcare information is transmitted back and forth. It is not necessarily subject to HIPAA, but I advise people often to behave as if it is, because try explaining to somebody, a, a civilian, um, after you've breach your database or cloud uh, storage uh, service, well, I didn't have to do anything better because it's not subject to HIPAA. And the patient said, what do you mean? Uh, this is my health information. I don't, you, can't ex you can't explain yourself out of that box, and if you're in business, it's a public relations nightmare, and you just don't want to deal with that. So behave as if you are subject to HIPAA, even if you aren't quite. And this comes up uh, in the context of consumer-facing health apps, for example. So it's not an a electronic health record. It's not something that is generated by a healthcare provider. It's something that's a, a tool that's offered to patients to help manage their own care. So we don't enter the HIPAA world. However, it would make sense to treat that data as being subject to the same sorts of protections. And as I'll mention a little later, to a certain extent, they are subject to some of the same protections um, under, under uh, authority of a different set of laws. But um, just to, to, to back up for a bit, um, in the world of uh, HIPAA, protected health information can be shared among health care providers and payers for three purposes only, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. And anything outside of that requires patient authorization. So one of the interesting changes in the rule is around marketing. So marketing used to be pretty much well ensconced in the realm of healthcare services or healthcare operations. And now it's sort of broken out as being distinct from that. There's certain kinds of communications that you might think of as marketing that are considered healthcare operations and others that are not. And if you're on the wrong side of that line, you now need advanced permission from a patient to engage in that communication, which is sort of counterintuitive. So, um, for example, someone who's in the business of providing reminders to patients that are tied to other sorts of information that might be considered marketing, now you need advanced permission from a patient to send them a reminder that includes a piece of marketing. Counterintuitive, not necessarily what um, makes sense in the long run, 
and is uh, troubling. One business involved in this sort of uh, issue took the Department of Health and Human Services to court over this and sought to get an injunction. Said, you're, you're limiting my constitutionally protected commercial speech. If you say, I need permission to talk to a patient before I talk to them and uh, I can't get that permission without talking to them, then you're, you're, you're prohibiting me from telling them they need a refill for their prescription medication, which everyone would agree they ought to be taking and we want them to take. And we want to help people adhere to their uh, medication regimens. So um, that case has been put on hold while the government said, look, we said we would issue some guidance in this area. We're going to issue some guidance. We're not going to enforce this rule for a couple of months. You guys take a look at this guidance. Let us know if you think it's reasonable. Uh, if it is, great. If not, we'll see you back in court. We understand. So we're sort of we're in that time period now. Uh, so the so government is being pretty realistic and reasonable in this in this realm in enforcing the HIPAA rules. So it's not they're not trying to put people out of business. Not trying to fine people to death, although they'd like to make examples of a few people now and then, as you see in the headlines. But the goal is not to make money for the government off of people's non-compliance with HIPAA. The goal is to get the community at large to comply with HIPAA. And one of the things that the new rule has done is has subjected business associates to the same level of scrutiny and compliance requirements that was previously limited to healthcare providers. So for the most part, folks in this room are business associates rather than healthcare providers. And uh, what this means is basically in the past, a business associate was simply asked to sign a business associate agreement. You basically agree, uh, sure, yeah, we keep stuff private that's supposed to be private, and we have a reasonable system in place. And as long as you sign the agreement that a hospital or a physician practice put in front of you, they were happy and they didn't look beyond that. They are now responsible for looking behind that and making sure that you actually know what you're talking about when it comes to HIPAA. And you are on the hook as they are for your misfeasance or malfeasance to the tune of potential million dollar fines. And that is new. Um, and that is something that a lot of folks have not quite caught yet, uh, but it's an important issue because, again, we're looking at this from a patient protection perspective, and if the privacy and security of patient data is not upheld, then healthcare providers and their business associates and the business associates' subcontractors, including, for example, Amazon and Google, who are now entering into business associate agreements with uh, folks in the healthcare industry um, are going to be subject to significant liability. Now, how uh, the rule actually said if you can't get a business associate to sign an agreement, they are nevertheless going to be subject to the business associate uh, agreement basic um, provisions as outlined in the regulations. So for years, Amazon had said we don't we don't do business associate agreements. If you want that, just you know, go elsewhere. We're not going to deal with it. Um, what the rule change did was made Amazon develop their own business associate agreement. And in fact, it, what it essentially does is really protects Amazon, um, which is no surprise. And other, other cloud hosting services would do similar things. Basically said, don't give us anything to store that is uh, health data, right? So um, if you do that, you're in breach of your terms of service will shut off your service. Um, what you have to do is encrypt it. Don't even give it to us to store for you unless it's encrypted. And under HIPAA, if data is encrypted, then if you lose it, you don't have to tell anybody. There's no remediation to do because it's basically not readable. Right? If it's encrypted properly. So, uh, the sort of interesting little uh, uh, approach that the cloud hosting providers have taken, and um, while encryption is, you know, is generally a good idea, it is not 100% necessary to be done for all 
covered entities and business associates. Why? Um, it may be under certain state laws, it may be under other regulatory schemes, but under HIPAA, encryption, which we all think of as, well, sure, you know, why don't these guys who keep getting their laptops stolen out of the back of rental cars and end up on the front page of the, uh, uh, of the, of the HIPAA reporter, uh, why don't they just encrypt the hard drive, right? You hear about all these uh, uh, Blue Cross plans or Sutter Health in California, somebody loses a laptop with a million patient files on it, and they're fined a million bucks and subject to a compliance plan, et cetera, et cetera. Why didn't they just encrypt it? Uh, well, maybe in the future they will, but uh, encryption is one of the security rules, uh, quote unquote, addressable standards. So HIPAA is broken down into the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, and the enforcement rule. And the security rule, instead of having simple one-size-fit-all standards, has what they call addressable standards, which means you don't necessarily have to encrypt. If you encrypt, then you're protected. There's, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of protection that's, that's given to you there. But you can decide that encryption isn't right for you based on the size of your operation, the kind of information you're dealing with, et cetera, et cetera. And the same is true for other HIPAA security standards as well. Um, unfortunately, I could go on and on about this, but um, what I'd like to do is shift gears and move beyond HIPAA, and as I said, um, there are other sets of rules that deal with this as well. So, um, in the context that I was describing before, sort of the consumer-facing app, it's not an electronic health record. Right? If you enter your own data and it's stored in the cloud and you get it back for yourself or you share it with somebody else, that's not an electronic health record um, run by a healthcare provider that's subject to HIPAA. It's really a, a personal health record, or, or it could be a sort of, I think of all of these apps as really being sort of special purpose uh, PHRs, personal health records. And those are subject, not to HIPAA, but to the Federal Trade Commission's rules on breach notification, which, oddly enough, are almost identical to the HIPAA rules on breach notification. But they don't come with the privacy and security overlay as well. But bottom line, that means if if someone unauthorized, gets unauthorized access to the data, you have to tell your customer, uh, gee, you know, I left the keys to the car on the counter in the laundromat, and somebody drove off with that. Uh, and you need to be able to be accountable to your customers in that way. In order to do a better job of being accountable, so this is how we sort of back into this, um, the Federal Trade Commission doesn't require that you maintain uh, privacy and security standards, but if you don't want to be in the position of having to give uh, breach notices to people, you want to make sure that you have privacy and security well under control. Um, another related uh, rule that became effective just in the last month or so is a federal communications rule, uh, commission rule, FCC rule on texting. And this gets back to the question of authorization, patient authorization. You may no longer text a patient a reminder for an appointment unless you have advance written authorization from the patient to do so. So that's relatively new, and that is something that will be enforced by yet another three-letter acronym of the federal government, the FCC. Um, you tell me when I should shut up. No, no, you don't have um, any time limit. Okay. Um, <laughs> but um, we talked about the uh, uh, sort of cloud issues. I wanted to back up and talk a little bit about um, the balance that has to happen between usability for patients on the one hand and security and privacy on the other hand. And uh, sort of for some of the things that are not strictly speaking subject to HEPA, or if you're looking at standards that are addressable standards, you want to consider what's going to make the data as usable as possible. Okay? So if you don't have a requirement to do something a certain way, some people default to, well, I'm going to take the most restrictive approach. But I would say that you need to be cognizant of what the most restrictive approach might be 
but try to do something in a, in a user-friendly way and, and make it as user-friendly as possible. And again, the basic guideline here should be the fact that these rules exist for the protection of patients' interests. So if you do something that makes life complicated for a patient, I would say you're not doing your job. Um, so what, what do I mean specifically? I want to ensure that records are available to patients and can be shared easily with patients, among patients, and sometimes for research purposes or for sort of crowdsourced knowledge on a rare disease, for example, the best approach to sharing information is not going to be through sharing of a, of a de-identified patient record under HIPAA. What happens now is that many healthcare organizations will share data with um, uh, quote unquote healthcare big data companies for analysis that be uh, aggregated with records from other healthcare providers and then questions can be posed to the data. Um, but that can be used only if the individual records are de-identified. So what does it mean to be de-identified? There's two approaches to de-identification. One means stripping out 18 different categories of identifying information like social security number, um, first three digits of your uh, zip code, things like that. Anybody know what the 18th category is? Is it the uh, identifier? There's one that's like generic identifier that you originate, which is really interesting. But. Yeah, well, so, yeah, what I'm thinking of is, is, is this catch-all, because yeah. uh, these rules, you know, the, the world moves on. If you can work backwards from yeah. that ID, you're, you're in trouble. Right. Yeah. It's anything else that could be used to re-identify a de-identified record, right? And since we probably double the amount of data that we put online every, I don't know, day by lunchtime. Um, the number of records that are truly de-identified uh, decreases daily, right? Um, so in order to truly de-identify something, you have to do something that's called statistical de-identification, separate process and um, more technical than I'm able to get into here. But uh, then you can share the data, you can put it to a big data shop in a giant database. Somebody who has, you know, 80 million longitudinal health records and can do all kinds of wonderful research. Um, the problem with the research is that the data that's been stripped out may be the data that you're really interested in in your research question, right? So you've made it usable by making it unusable. Um, and what I am in favor of seeing is a way of aggregating data that's contributed into a database by patients directly. So then we would be able to work around HIPAA. Right? So you don't have to worry about the identification. If a patient says, here's my record, here folks, put it into your database, go crazy, uh, just don't use my name. Um, I don't care if you have my uh, uh, other identifying characteristics because I have a rare disease I'd rather that more people with a rare disease have access to information uh, and I don't care so much about privacy. Um, so that's, uh, that's an approach that some people are taking. There are a couple of uh, startups now that are taking this to the next level and sort of allowing folks to donate in records and uh, share records uh, with sort of a social overlay and um, ultimately I don't think we're ever going to get, or certainly not in the next uh, couple of years, we're not going to have um, a donated record set that has 200 million longitudinal uh, you know, whatever uh, sets of medical records, but we'll get there. And I think it becomes a more usable data set. And um, I think that's, that's about all I wanted to, to talk about specifically. Um, I think it's important to think about openness as a goal, you know, despite these restraints from the HIPAA perspective. Um, I don't know if folks have particular uh, comments or questions about HIPAA or other privacy issues. I'd be happy to you know, continue the conversation. Thank you very much.
question and answer for Yeah, we'll have a panel discussion okay. in uh, five minutes. Okay, uh, great. Minutes. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the enlightening talk, David. Um, I'm going through all those issues right now. <laughs> About uh, as Matt pointed out, we are uh, piloting that project with uh, Jocelyn Diving Center, and uh, they want to look into our HIPAA compliance system. They want to look into everything. <laughs> uh, it's not just, uh, and we're not even collecting uh, patient sensitive data at all. But they still want to make sure that everything is HIPAA compliant and uh, encrypted and secure. So I know that pain points. Well, uh, we'll take a uh, quick ten minutes break, and uh, let's review. The next half of the session is a panel discussion, so um, so um, it's a community-oriented um, kind of uh, discussion, so uh, anything is allowed. So let's take a quick 10 minutes break, and uh, please uh, feel free to buy the beverages and food uh, from the cafe. They have uh, given us this space for free, so please help them out. So let's um, get back here in 10 minutes and make sure there's no stampede at the restrooms. Thank you. In a, in a kiosk uh, uh, and then uploading it to an EHR and is there liability for the storage and transmission of that data um, in the kiosk setting? And the, the answer is probably that if you're going to be um, transmitting that to a healthcare provider, you're going to become a, a business associate of that healthcare provider uploading data into an EHR or simply providing it some other way. And so whether or not you have um, an independent requirement to implement some sort of privacy and security protocol for the patient, which I would argue that you, you may, um, you would probably have that as a matter of contract with your healthcare provider institutions that you're dealing with. Um, I think as I said before, like uh, in the Federal Trade Commission context, you're holding data, even if you wipe it at the end of every day, you're holding patient data for some period of time, 
and you're subject to the breach notification rule under the Federal Trade Act. So um, I think you're, you're caught both ways. So should you go and buy some insurance, like the other providers would buy insurance? Right, I mean, insurance is part of it, but you also need the, the to implement a, a system of, of privacy and security protocols that uh, will hopefully eliminate the need to call in your insurer for protection. <laughs> Which your insurer will want to see if you uh, if you ask them to write your policy too. Uh, they're not going to insure uh, insure cowboys. They're going to insure people who who have you know, systems in place to, to mitigate risk. Karen, yes, sir. you uh, you used two sets of terms. I'm just wondering whether there's a conflict or not. At one point, you said that the interpreter is ethically bound not to add or subtract anything from the conversation. In another place in your talk, you talked about um, providing culturally appropriate care. Can the interpreter intervene to uh, ed ed educate the provider to the cultural conditions of the patient? Absolutely. And, and, you know, you've touched on the heart, I think, of what the medical interpreter experience is defined by. Because the whole point being, for instance, that you may use a term, right, that the patient may not understand. But the patient may use a term that you not understand. So let's say, for instance, that uh, let's, let's begin, I guess, with the provider side, because that tends to be, I think, easier for most people to begin with. So let's say, for instance, that we have a Cape Verde and Creole-speaking patient, you know, from the Cape Verde Islands off of West Africa. And you just simply want to get some background information on the patient regarding, you know, their health condition. If you ask someone if they have an allergy, that's not a five-second question. It's a ten-minute conversation. Because Cape Verde's dialect, or Portuguese, does not have a commonly understood term for allergy. So you're using a term the patient has no idea what you're talking about. It might as well be, you know, a purple-headed octopus. So the whole point being, you know, the provider asks the question, and the interpreter has to step out of that hole for one second and say, you know, doctor, nurse, nurse practitioner, I just want you to understand this patient does not actually understand the term allergy. So I'm actually going to have to engage them in an extended discussion in terms of have you ever had one of these 1,500 physiological responses? <laughs> so any of one of these 100, 1,500 potential triggers. And after 10 minutes, I hope we have an answer. Now, if you go to the other side, you know, a patient may use a term that the provider's not familiar with. So, for instance, let's say that you have a Khmer, Cambodian-speaking patient, you know, who came to the United States in the 1980s following the Khmer Rouge disaster. So it's entirely possible that if this patient has some issues related to loss of family members from the context of spiritual beliefs, they may talk about consulting a fortune teller. And you may not have a context to appreciate what that may mean but it's a very understood practice within the Khmer culture that if you wish to communicate with dead relatives, you would consult a fortune teller, would make the appropriate offerings to the spirits, and attempt to offer some clarification about what recent health problems you may have and how it may be related outside the physical world to the spiritual world. So that's the one specific, well, I should say there are two specific exemptions. So one is actually specifically related to, you know, this communication question, right? To what degree can the provider understand the patient, and vice versa, because it is a two-way street. And then the second is the same as any other medical professional, that if we are you know, aware of or have reasonable cause to believe that either party is engaged in either self-harm or help harm of someone else, that they're obligated to go beyond the bounds of their role and make the appropriate parties aware of that situation. So I hope that helps answer your question. Can I notice that as an interpreter? That is a very tricky question. So describe your nurse. Um, what's her background? Where was she born? If she was a Chinese immigrant who was a nurse, she could speak Chinese and English, and if there was a Chinese patient. OK, so in, let's, let's, I think, take a step back and think for a moment. So the, there are two separate questions here. Because now we have a nurse, for instance, who's comfortable engaging this Chinese-speaking patient. Now we first have, I guess, the question of technical proficiency. So let's say, for instance, for the purpose of our discussion, that this nurse went through her nursing program at Bunker Hill Community College, or Boston College School of Nursing, or any one of the other vertical-regarded nursing programs in the greater Boston area. 
Well, then the question becomes, how good is her technical terminology of medical terms in her mother language? Because I can stipulate the degree to which she understands it in English, because she could not possibly have passed her program up. But then you have the reverse problem of someone who completed their medical training in Brazil and came to the United States and now has to make sure that they're equally qualified to do so in English. Now, there's actually a technical distinction between a bilingual provider and an interpreter. So, for instance, if a nurse is acting within her own scope of practice, engaging the patient one-on-one, -on -one, then she is not an interpreter. She is providing nursing care under the scope of her existing license in a language other than English. But then as soon as the doctor says, nurse, please come over here, I have to ask the patient a question, then they're acting as an interpreter. And then there are actually very strict joint commission regulations that come into effect that say that at a minimum, the person must be tested, deemed competent in those languages, and authorized to do so by the hospital in that capacity as a portion of their duties. And that is a standard that is very rarely, if ever, met, which is part of the reason why people end up leaving themselves exposed unintentionally. One of the most frequent issues for this type of problem is actually the residency programs. Because you have many residents coming from medical schools outside the United States, and the intending physician will say, you just asked the patient one of your questions, and now you will ask him one of mine. And then what ethical situation do you end up in? Where you need the goodwill of this attending physician if you intend to move beyond residency to fellowship and hopefully a practice of your own. And it places people in very difficult ethical positions. Yeah, in that case, are you responsible if you end up being in a situation where you are an interpreter for some reason in a situation like that? Are you are we responsible if we just interpret wrongly or yes. so means that we are responsible for and, and it ends up being very risky, especially because if it's outside the bounds of your job description, then you shouldn't be doing it. But if the if someone in the hospital asks us because they had no other choice. And that's, and and, but see, that's the thing. That it comes down to a question of is there no other choice? Because then the fact of the matter is, it becomes a question for the Joint Commission, as well as for CMS and the Department of Public Health, that why is there not an interpreter services policy in place? Why are there not backup resources available? This is part of the reason why Stewart went with a technology-based backup system. The point being, there is always an appropriate qualified alternative. Even if it's for a language that's very rare, that we did not know about in advance, that we don't staff for, there are still alternative venues that we can access and depend upon. And that's part of the reason why there's this emphasis, at least within Stewart during my time there, that we have to have tiers of support, that we have levels we can fall back to when we're in crisis. I hope that answers your question. Um, actually, I have a question. Um, maybe as a provider, as a representative provider, actually, I was thinking that um, if having a patient authorize the use of PHI kind of protects providers somewhat, sort of authorizing third parties to use it. You're talking about this patient data cloud, but in general, if that protects the providers and businesses from disclosure risks under HIPAA, why aren't there forms, or why isn't there just an additional form when a patient goes to a provider to get service that says, I authorize you to provide my data to a third party for use for X, Y, and Z purpose? which is say, you could say no or yes, but there's an option at least to authorize use of the data um, in a more general way. Sort of some, you know, why, why I guess, what, wouldn't a provider want to give that option so they would reduce their risks for disclosure? Wouldn't a patient maybe be interested in allowing the data to be used? Well, the, yeah, I guess the question is about uh, sort of authorized, sort of giving blanket authorization in advance to sharing of patient data as the patient and I think there's a there's a hesitancy to use sort of blanket authorizations like that um, because the, the the rules actually speak to specific authorization. I authorize you to release X to 